whatsoever is honest. The word semnos describes truth in action according to the truth of God's word. A person who believes the truth can live a life of honesty, true to yourself and true to others, gives a clear conscience. By the law of God, one cannot be thwarted to live an honest life, a blameless life. It's a high calling that God gives us to live. And the Lord uh, teaches us, and this word, uh, honest, uh, speaks of things worthy, honourable, noble, in the sight of God. God's light shines through us, speaks of actions in the light of God's word. Truthfulness is the word there, uh, and the Lord wants us to hold fast to the truth by practising it. An honest man is the noblest work of God. M. F. Tupper described the honest man when he said, Trust payeth homage unto truth, rewarding the honest man. And all men learned to lean on him who never failed or fainted. Freedom groweth in his eyes, and nobleness of nature in his heart, and independence took a crown and fixed on his head, so he stood in his integrity, just and firm of purpose, aiding many, fearing some, a spectacle to angels and to men. Yea, when the shattered globe shall rock in the throes of dissolution, still will he stand in his integrity, sublime and honest man. Daniel was such a man. In Daniel verse 1, chapter 1 and verse 8 says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He was one of those young men who were held captive in Babylon and there, in their captivity, he set his heart to put God first, to have a high view of God and his laws. And therefore, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the idolatry of the Babylonians. The Bible described Daniel as in a very special way, in Daniel 6, verse 3, it says, Then they, this Daniel was preferred above the precedents, even the precedents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. An excellent spirit. Where did he get that excellent spirit? Because he was someone who spent time meditating upon the Word of God so that he knew the Word of God and he is one who is set to practice the Word of God. Daniel was such an honest man. The kings of Babylon and Persia trusted him. He was honoured in Babylon for being a true follower of the Lord God. He possessed true wisdom. Daniel was true to God. What a man for our emulation, an honest man, true and true. The Greek word semnos, it is described to be difficult to translate, is the word which is characteristically used of the gods and of the temples of the gods. When used to describe a man, it describes a person who, as it had been, moved through the world as it were the temple of God. Isn't it so true? It exemplifies Daniel's life. Even the kings come to him to understand and know the truth. The will of God, the God of heaven and earth, Daniel's life exemplifies such a life, a godly life, <clears throat> based on the truth. It is commanded, Joshua said, this book, Joshua, 
in Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. It is the character of a godly man. Psalm 1 verse 2, that his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his, in his law doth he meditate day and night. And David saith in Psalm 119 verse 92, Unless thy law have been my delight, I should then have perished in my affliction. Unless the law of God has been my delight, the law of God undergird him, grant him the wisdom and the strength to pull through the difficult times, those valley moments when he walked in the valley of the shadow of death. God was with him because the law of God undergird him. It was his delight. In other words, he was meditating upon the truth of God, of God's care for him, that God makes no mistakes and God loves him to the uttermost and therefore it gives him the strength to overcome, to trust God during the times of his affliction. Simnos is used four times in the New Testament. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 and 11, Likewise, must the deacons be grave, that's the word there, semnos, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not guilt, greedy or filthy lucre. And verse 11 of 1 Timothy 3, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Titus 2.2, 2, that the aged men must be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Birkitt said, answer the dignity of our high calling. Agree with the gravity and comeliness of the Christian profession. Indeed, God has given us a high calling to be men of truth, an honest person, whatsoever is true. May we meditate and practice it. Meditation is a deep and earnest musing upon some points, some point of Christian instruction to strengthen us against the flesh, the world, and the devil. Isaac Ambrose. It is through meditation that we find the wherewithal to protect ourselves in the time of temptation. The strength to resist the devil, the world, and the flesh, and to lead us forward toward the kingdom of heaven. Meditation is a steadfast bending of the mind to some spiritual matter, discoursing of it with ourselves until we bring the same to some profitable issue. The mind steadfast, discoursing on the spiritual matter until we come to a conclusion what is the way for us? We have understood it, and therefore we know how to act. So a thought, it is said, and rip and act. So an act and rip the habit. So a habit and rip a character. So a character and rip a destiny. It is by our thought that determines indeed our destiny and therefore how important it is that we would be grounded on the truth and that the truth brings a conviction in our hearts to live a life that is pleasing in the sight of God. Meditation is the raising of the heart to holy affections. Meditation heals the soul of its deadness and earthliness. Indeed, when we meditate upon the Word of God, our hearts are enlivened to know, to life, to spiritual life, to a thriving spiritual life. Thomas Watson. Thoughts are the caterers of the soul that make provision for faith and fetch in food and refreshed it with the comfort of the promises. Thoughts are caterers of the soul. Indeed, it begins there. Our thoughts would lead us, the right thoughts, to make provision for faith and deliver food 
to refresh and comfort the heart. Our hopes arise according to the largeness of our thoughts. It is a great advantage to have our eyes open to view the riches of our inheritance and to have a distinct view of the hope of our calling. The Apostle prays for the Ephesians, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches and glory of his inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 1.8, the quotes from Thomas Menton. Those, who, those Christians that are backward to the duty of meditation find none of those impulses and meltings of love that are in others. They do not endeavour to comprehend the height and breadth and length and depth of the love of Christ. Therefore, no wonder that their hearts are so narrow and so much impoverished towards God. Thus, you see, it is a necessary duty. Thomas Menton, how important it is that we must be forward and not backward to the duty of meditation so that God's love may be shared abroad in our hearts, that we may comprehend the height and breadth and length and depth of the love of Christ. Men of barren thoughts are usually of low hopes and for want of getting to the top of Pisgah to view the land, our hearts sink within us. Pisgah, the place where Moses viewed the promised land, the land of hope, the mount of hope, there when we meditate upon the Word of God in the mount, we are given a glimpse of the glory. Certainly, hope thriveth best on the mount of meditation. Then for love, the sparkles of affection will not flow out unless we beat upon the will by constant thoughts. We beat on the will, upon the will, by constant thoughts, by constantly thinking and meditating upon the right things to do our will is inclined, channeled, directed to the will of God, to the path of blessing. Affection is nourished by apprehension. And the more constant and deliberate the thoughts are, the love is always deeper. How we need to take time to think and arrest our thoughts to the heavenly things. The circumstances of meditation, the time, what is the best time? No time can be prescribed to all men, for neither is God bound to ours, nor does the contrary disposition of men agree in one choice of opportunities. So it depends on you, for you, what is the best time? Some find their hearts most in frame in the morning. Others learn wisdom from their hearts in the night season. And others find Isaac's time, the even tide, the better time, who went in the evening to meditate. Genesis 24, 63. No practice of others can prescribe to us in this circumstance. It is enough that we set apart that time wherein we are most suited for that service. The circumstances of meditation, the place we judge solitariness and solitary places fittest for meditation, especially for set and solitary meditation. Thus, we found Jesus meditating alone in the mount, John the baptizer in the desert, David on his bed, Daniel in his house, and Isaac in the field. What is the best place for you? We must, in this case, abandon worldly society, both outward and inward. Many isolate themselves from the visible company of men, yet carry a world within them. Both these societies are enemies to this meditation. Let us know the danger and let us be instructed how we may meditate properly. The circumstances, the matter for 
meditation. It must be divine and spiritual, that is God's word, or some part of it. It is woeful to think how some meditate on sin, contrary to God's word, studying to go to hell with the least noise in the world. God forbid that that would happen. But we are to meditate upon the word of God, whether it's a small part or a large part, upon the word. 